I, I don't remember anything, so. episode four i can't believe we're on episode four. i cannot believe All we right. made it to episode four so it's been one heck of a week since we last talked to you yeah i um went to go to the post office to mail some packages and the hoa stole our bushes yes we live in an hoa area and they took bush one and bush two like just pull out of the garage glance over and i'm like the heck are our bushes they're, they're gone. So I snap a picture. I send it to Micah. They stole our bushes. We have a Facebook group. and I post, For the HOA. Yeah, for the HOA. And I posted a picture of our now bare front lawn without any bushes that said, moment of silence for bush one and bush two. They were not impressed by my picture. <laughs> oh, but they're really not going to be impressed by what we're going to do. Micah's mom. Hi, Micah's mom. Hi. I don't know exactly how we got from point A to point B to what we're about to do. We picked up like some Halloween decorations, so we're going to put out some tombstones. Yeah, Dollar Tree has Halloween decorations out early, guys. Go get them. I love it. We're going to put up like a little memorial service. We're going to paint a tombstone for Bush 1 and Bush 2, and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. HOA is going to hate us. Oh, we'll keep you all updated on that. <laughs> <laughs> there, if they really, really want to push it, there will be a candlelit vigil for Bush I know, 1 right? and Bush 2. We, we, we have it planned. We We've have... already contacted people. If they have a problem with our Halloween decorations, we're having a vigil. Anyway, what's our case today anyway? Okay, so our case is actually a really tough case. And when I say tough, I mean hard to research. Like, there was nothing out there. But I'm going to start by saying, you're sitting down, you're watching one of your very favorite musicals, Chicago. I do like Chicago. You hear the dun-dun-dun. He had it coming. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Suboctane. Suboctane. Yes. He only had himself to blame. And then you hear this little lady come on, and she's all like, what am I doing here? They say my famous lover held down my husband while I chopped off his head. But it's not true. I'm innocent. I don't know why Uncle Sam says I did it. I tried to explain at the police station, but they didn't understand. And Roxy goes, yeah, but did you do it? She goes, uh-uh, not guilty. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Are those the translations? Yes, those are the translations. Oh, okay, so it's a foreign lady. So what you guys may not know is Chicago's actually based on true actual events. Roxy was actually a woman named Eula Anon. I can't believe I forgot her name. Okay, so uh, Roxy was actually based on another woman in the 1920s who killed her husband named or her lover named Beulah Anon. Velma was based off of another lady who also killed her lover named Belva Gardner. Ah, okay. But the one that we just read, the beautiful home- Wait, she's the one who in the show in the movie hangs, right? Yes, yeah, she's the the white ballerina. She is also based on somebody, and her story is actually pretty sad. Okay, so we're going to talk about a ballerina today. No, but she's based on the Hungarian ballerina, and her real name is Sibella Nevi. Oh, that's such a pretty name, Sibella. I like that name, She, instead of being a Hungarian immigrant, she was an Italian immigrant in the 1920s who was accused of killing her husband. 
Okay. And this is her story. Okay. And so you couldn't find a lot. I mean, you would think you'd be able to find more information if it was. You can find all kinds of information on Gula and Gardner. Roxy and Velma. You can find all kinds of information on Roxy and Velma. But there is like maybe three or four articles out there on Sabella Needy and a book. And guys, okay, I found little excerpts on the book and I found an interview from the author. So if you guys want a more in-depth version of, or of this story, I would definitely go look her up. The book is called Ugly Prey, An Innocent Woman, and the Death Sentence That Scandalized Jazz Age Chicago. It's a long title. But the author is Emily Labu Le Lecce? L-U-C-C-E-S-I. That, that's... It's Italian, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. If there's anybody out there who can translate Italian Let us names know. better. Yeah. Again, I found little snippets from her book and an interview and a couple of articles, but literally that's it. Yeah. It's almost like Chicago tried to erase this from happening. What? You didn't start with Wikipedia? There isn't a Wikipedia. Who? Doesn't she it? does not have a Wikipedia. Her lawyer has a Wikipedia, but she is mentioned in one sentence of the lawyer's Wikipedia. Wow. So she's basically a footnote. She is a footnote. So okay. that was what I was dealing with. But what I was able to figure out was that Sabella may or may not have killed her husband. We don't know. And that Sabella didn't hang. Oh, I'm just going to give away the ending. She Spoilers. didn't hang. Spoilers. But <laughs> how she didn't hang is one amazing story. And that's the one you're going to tell us today, yes. right? So unlike the musical, she survives all of this. Also, okay. time out. My mom reviewed us and she said that we cuss a lot. And that's not good for people who are driving in their cars with their kids in the backseat. Please. Okay. Here's the thing. Mom. I will do you a favor. Missy and I will try our hardest not to cuss, okay? But guys, listeners, please do not listen to us with your kids in the back seat, okay? That's like a deal for us both, right? We'll try not to cuss. You don't listen to us with your kids in the back seat unless you have headphones in. I mean, which don't be driving with headphones because then you can't hear the cars around you and that's kind of dangerous. I see a lot of people do that, actually. I don't get it, but that's a weird thing. But that's a whole off topic. Yeah. But, Sorry to go off topic. Uh, I mean, because just... guys, really, in some story, some of our stories are going to get kind of graphic. I mean, in the last episode, go check it out, Madeline Murray O'Hare. She was dismembered. Yeah. So <laughs> please do not listen to, to us with your kids in the backseat unless they can tolerate dismemberment. I mean, well, not like <laughs> literally tolerant. <laughs> Don't dismember your kids. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, continue. Yeah, okay, so we start our story out. Sabella Needy was uh, born. I Wait, she was born? In Bari, Bari, B-A-R-I, Italy. Her husband, because we don't know that much about her life, because, again, she's a footnote. But her husband went to America almost a decade before Sabella did. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think they call them white widows. I'm not really sure. But it's like where your husband goes off for like 10 years and then suddenly comes back and goes, hey, by the way, I got us a place in America. You're coming with us. And that's exactly what. So he like, was he like trying to like send money back home? I don't know. Or trying to save up passage to bring her. I'm assuming, I assume they have kids over. I'm assuming that they did or that he did send money back home. They had three kids. They had a son named James who at the time of the trials and everything was 24, Michael was 23 or 22, and Charlie was 16. She was in her 40s at the time of the trial. Anyways, so okay. her husband decides to come back and say, I found us a place. You're coming back with me. Bring your sons. We're going to go live 
in America, where they settled in a very dilapidated farm with no running water, no electricity. I mean, it was just pretty bad. Well, it, it was the 1920s. Yes, and those but were... in the 1920s, even like the most poorest of homes had running water and electricity in Chicago. Okay, so they were just like... They were beyond poor. They were poor of poor. They were what you would call dirt poor. Yes. I never understood that dirt poor. Well, it's probably it because, because your floors are dirt. Or they have no running water, so they get dirty. Well, then they would just be dirty poor. <laughs> So, anyways, they grew vegetables, which they would sell to restaurants and, I guess, the market. Makes sense. Yeah. Farmers grow things. While they were settled in Chicago, she had two little girls. Do not know their names. Okay, so that makes for a total of five kids. They have the three boys before their 10-year split, and then as soon as they get back together, they have two more. Okay. Yeah. They have the oldest one, who is... Who is Asshat James. Oh, Asshat. Ooh, nice. It's not a cuss word. Ass is a donkey. He's just stubborn and mean. <laughs> and Michael, who is also Asshat Michael. Okay, so we have Asshat 1 and Asshat 2. Yes, but Charlie we like. Just heads up on And that. nice Charlie. Yeah. Her husband... So you have two donkeys and a Charlie horse. So our... <laughs> <laughs> her husband was kind of a mean drunk. A uh, like... I, um, I don't know how bad their relationship was. I don't know if he was, like, a nice guy when he wasn't drunk. But when he got drunk, he could get pretty violent. And he normally took it out on Asshat 1 and Asshat 2. So he's abusive. Yes. When they moved to Chicago, the boys didn't really stay at home with, you know, mom and dad. Uh, James immediately moved out. Um, I heard under an assumed name. I'm unsure if it was under an assumed name. Michael moved out, but he would come back and forth. And Charlie moved out. He was 16, but he came home a lot more than the other three boys just to check up on his mom. So he's a good he's son. He's a good son. We like this son. Okay, so we like Charlie. Yes. But we don't like James or Michael. Yeah. For example... Michael and Francisco, who is the father, Francisco um, Needy. I don't think I ever said his name, so there you go. Francisco Needy and Michael got into a fight about two weeks before he disappeared. Okay. Michael wanted Maybe before to, he was murdered. He disappeared. He just disappeared. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm in. Sorry. Or murdered. Whichever way you want to go. Whichever narrative you want to go with. Okay, I'll let you continue. Okay. So... <laughs> Michael and Francisco got into a fight about two weeks before his murder slash disappearance. Michael had fallen in love with this girl. Italian immigrants or Italian American immigrants had this custom that if they wanted to marry, the man in the relationship had to pay for the wedding. Okay, because normally it's the bride that pays for the wedding. Well, an Italian American, he okay. had to pay for the wedding and prove that he could take care of dude, the wife. Dude, your family lives in a ha- in a shack with no electricity and no running water, but you're so, asking them for money. <laughs> Michael, I'm in all of his brilliance, does what every 20-year-old does or however old Michael was, dad, 22 years money. old. Yeah, he comes up to his dad and he's like, I found this girl that I really want to marry. And Francisco's reaction was instead of saying no or being embarrassed and saying, son, we can't afford for you to get married. He just punches Michael in the face. The heck kind of reaction is that? (laughs) Why'd you go Irish on me? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Because I can't do an Italian very well without, you know, making fun of Mario. Um, so, but, like, I, why would you just do that, though? That's basically... Dad, can I borrow money? Punch. <laughs> so Michael reacted also with violence. Well, let me guess, he punches back. Obviously, because at the end of it, Michael won that fight. Francisco winds up having broken ribs and some bruising by the end of that fight. Oh, good grief. I don't know what kind of condition Michael was in, but Francisco was like, that's it, I'm out. And he walked out. With broken ribs. With broken ribs and bruising. Wow. Guys, don't beat up your dad. He was gone for a few days. 
Like, okay. literally just disappeared for a few days after that fight. Just licking his wounds, you know? I My pride is hurt. I got beat up by my son. I don't know whether to be proud or angry. So I want <laughs> you to remember this because if he had the ability to leave... And come back and be gone for time. Yeah. Like, I'm wondering if this was not, like, a something he'd already done in the past. I mean, obviously, he left her in, like, Italy. If he left her in Italy for <laughs> 10 years, so, I mean. Yeah. He was gone for a couple days, but he did come back. And it was actually two weeks later in July of 1922 on a Saturday night around 9 p.m. Francisco told Sabella to go up to bed that he would be up later. He told her he was worried someone would try and burn their crops and he wanted to guard them. They were supposed to take the crops to market in the morning. That's Oddly specific. I know. Very oddly specific. Hey, I said specific. No problem. Good I job. can never say that word. Yay. <laughs> anyway, so around one or two, Sabella wakes up from her nap in bed or whatever. You know, she was sleeping. She woke up. Her husband is not in bed with her. And she's like, that's a little bit strange. But is he still guarding the crops? So she gets up and she goes downstairs and she starts looking for him. He's not outside in the farm. He's not anywhere that he should be so she starts panicking like a like a loving wife should do she goes now sabella cannot speak english i cannot stress this enough she cannot speak english and the italian she speaks is not your normal italian she speaks Barry's italian not your traditional italian so even italian people can't speak to her so it, it's kind of like she speaks like a dialect that is not mainstream. Okay, that's really super fun. Mm -hmm. And not that's definitely not going to come back to bite her in the um, donkey. Yes. <laughs> the donkey. She winds up going to a farmhand by the name of Peter. And she's like, my husband is gone. So does he speak that dialect? He does speak English and he speaks her dialect. Okay. So, so she, he, she woke him up and she's like, my husband is gone. I have to go to the magistrate to report him, right? As one does. As one does. Normally it's the police station, but the magistrate was closer to her house. So that makes sense. Yes. She's and like trying to, like, my husband isn't here. He was supposed to be here. We've and looked I, all around. I had to look it up. So a magistrate is a civil officer or a judge who administers the law, especially one who conducts a court that deals with minor offenses and holds preliminary hearings for more serious ones. So they'll come back later in the story. Okay. So anyway, she walks with Peter a whole two miles by foot to the magistrate's so, house. So they have no wagon. You're getting ahead of me on this one. But yes, they have no wagon okay, right so now. She's walking. And it, she winds up telling the magistrate. And the magistrate is like, uh-uh, that's, that's an issue for the police. And instead of calling the police to his house, he makes her walk another mile in the opposite direction to the police station where she reports her husband missing using Peter to translate. Okay. And she's like, I don't know where my husband is. And they're like, hmm, that's weird. They immediately launch an investigation, obviously, because he's a missing person. And I want to say that they jumped in really quickly for somebody who had previously walked out. You know, to me, it would be like, you know, wait a couple of days, see if he comes back and then come back and report him missing. Right. But no, they jumped in very quickly, which, okay, for a police station, I give them props on this, that they would jump in very quickly to help a woman with a missing, uh, not child, with a missing husband. But anyway, so they send in Deputy Sheriff Dasso, I think that's how you say his name. Dasso. They send in Dasso to the farm to start his investigation. And he thought himself a regular Sherlock Holmes. He thought himself Wait, was he good? No. So he's so no Sherlock Holmes. He he's a wannabe Sherlock Holmes. But he's not good. He thought he could look at like evidence and deduce what happened. He somehow decided through whatever evidence he found on the farm 
Fitzabella was guilty. Okay. Wait, were there like blood stains or like you you got me anything? It's like he just walked got up, walked out, and disappeared. It's like there's no blood stains. It's like that I could find. In. Oh, this place is a shack. Well, yep, she definitely killed him. I mean, look at this place. <laughs> I would kill my husband too. So he <laughs> somehow deduced or decided that Sabella was guilty of having an affair with one of her farmhands, Peter. Remember Peter? The one who tra- translate. Okay, so let me get this straight. He walks into her house decides you're having an affair with the she's with this i guess she's with this guy in the middle of the night how dare she (laughs) but she can't speak english this guy speaks both english and her obscure italian and nobody really knows where he got this from there were no rumors there were no witnesses saying yeah they they were having an affair I mean, it's just like he looked at her and went, yeah, you're having an affair. Um, okay, but Sherlock. In wife. this case, I do think we need to take into consideration the fact that it's the 1920s and a lot of women were having affairs and killing either their husbands or their lovers. So maybe he was doing some rudimentary profiling based on previous cases and previous experience. I think that's what happened, but it just, it doesn't make too much sense to me. Well, if you, well, okay, if you go back to the real life Velma and Roxy. Yes. Like, uh, they both. Belva and Eula. Belva and Eula? Yeah, are their names. They they actually did and were actually guilty. But we should also note that that will not happen for two more years. Oh, okay. That hasn't happened yet. But there are a couple of other women that were before them. Okay. Like, it's the 1920s. Everybody's so, getting drunk and shooting their lovers or their husbands. I mean, it's a big phenomenon going on right now. A big epidemic going on right now. <laughs> I wonder how many of those were for life insurance policies. No, that would be a good question. It, was, <laughs> it should also be noted that in the 1920s, they didn't have that much in the way of protecting the woman from marital abuse. Oh, domestic abuse. domestic abuse. Uh, oh, okay. So they didn't have like, so they could have just been like shooting a abusive husband in yes. self-defense. Okay, so. Now... That's not everybody. Like, well, no, not everybody. Eula and Belva, yeah, not the same. Didn't you say but that we'll, Eula's we'll lover come back was like to putting them. his... But we'll come back to them. We're going to do an episode on those two I really want to do an episode we on We should them. so do an episode on those two. Anyway, guys, it, continue. It should also be noted that even though Dasso was also an Italian immigrant, his and Sabella still could not communicate. Because, again, she's speaking, like, an obscure dialect. Basically, Dasso is an Italian immigrant, and Sabella's an Italian immigrant. But they but, speak two different dialects. It's almost like a Dutch speaker trying to speak to an English speaker. They both come from the same base of language. The dialect derives from the same like... Source. Source. Yeah, there you go. Neither one of them can communicate with one another. Okay, so Deputy Sheriff Daiso arrested Sabella Nitti and Peter on adultery charges. Wait, that was the thing? Basically, those laws were created in the early 1800s for female settlers that no one really paid attention to in the 1920s. I mean, they were all drinking, boozing, partying, probably having sex. So it was okay for male settlers to carry on affairs, but not the female settlers. Gotcha. It was a weird, weird thing in the 1800s. (laughs) I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Well, it also, I guess, would have to depend on what groups were settling in the 1800s like maybe if they were of a more religious nature yeah but because dasso severely believed that sabella was guilty and the only evidence he had was the fact that peter and her were having an affair which was never actually proven Deputy Sheriff does so because it wasn't really a well-known charge and, like, nobody took that kind of charge seriously. He had to go to four different jurisdictions to find a judge willing to actually convict her for adultery charges. Really? Yeah. But they did actually find a judge, and she was arrested and jailed, as well as Peter, in the fall of 1922 to await trial. Okay, So they're charged with adultery. 
Not murder. Just adultery. That's just so weird. I know. It gets weirder. Uh, shortly after her arrest, James, the eldest son, as hat one. Okay, as hat one. Declared his father legally dead. With no evidence. With no evidence. And basically took the farm estate for himself. He liquidated the farm, the entire farm. He liquidated everything. And a judge threw that out and ordered him to pay Sabella $800. So the farm is liquidated. She's lost her home at this point, so, thanks to James. He left his two younger sisters homeless. I'm actually not sure who took the younger sisters. My bet is on Charlie because I he's hope the it good was one. Charlie. He's the good one. Um, she she does, I guess, wind up taking her daughters back. So I I don't know what happens in between this and that and all of this. But anyways, um, the magistrate threw out the charges on Sabella because like they had no evidence. Uh, but they threw out the charges on Sabella and the farmhand Peter. Who's now without a job because there's no farm to hand. Yep. And they were <laughs> released in December of 1922. They were destitute, alone, homeless, no job, no way to support each other. She can't even speak English. She can't. He can. And her husband was nowhere to be seen. Her livelihood was, it, it was bad. And okay, I'm yeah, assuming, definitely an asshat. I'm assuming one of her sons took her in. Again, I'm assuming it's Charlie. I'm assuming you're probably right. Charlie took in the younger sisters and Charlie took in mom because Charlie is a good boy. Yes, it was probably a very depressing winter for him. But it got better in the spring. She got remarried. Oh, okay. To Peter the farmhand. So they were having. Actually, I have no idea if they were having an affair or if they were pushed together through circumstances. Because remember, he speaks her dialect. So she may be clinging to the only person who might be able to get an actual job and help take care of her and her two young daughters. Exactly. I don't know if they were actually having an affair, but to me, if you're accused of having an affair and you're accused of killing your husband, do not marry the man who you were accused of having an affair with to kill your husband for. It's bad all around. It's gonna look so it, It's gonna suspicious. come back to bite her. Yeah, that's totally normal. It's gonna come back to bite her. Also, that said, affairs don't always lead to murder. Maybe they lead to divorce, but they don't always lead to murder. I am just gonna say that right now. No, no, there are plenty. That does not automatically mean she's guilty. There are plenty of people who carry on affairs. They don't kill their spouse. From what I was able to gather or understand, there was no evidence of violence on the farm. And the, through my research, it's like he just got up and he walked out. There, there was no evidence of any kind of violence. But if there was evidence of any kind of violence, well, you know, I would say she would obviously be a possible suspect. I mean, as well as a few other people. Well, Michael and James. Michael got into a fight not two weeks before he disappeared over money. And, and James, James liquidated things awful quick. The second quick. he got the farm, he liquidated for money. Now, I, I don't know if it was like, I can't run this farm and do my job at the same time. I don't know what to do. And we need the money. Maybe his thought was, I will pay for my mother's legal okay. team. Okay. So I don't know. Uh, there so maybe are he wasn't an, maybe he wasn't an ass hat. But they, he he wasn't on Okay, he probably wasn't an ass hat. Yeah, but there but, are reasons that he could have sold the farm to help his mother. We don't know like what his motivation was, but they do do lead into motivations because we do have older son who is awful quick to liquidate the farm. So that's a financial motive to have dad declared legally dead. We have and Michael. Liquid, and Michael, who wanted money. And has shown violence towards his father already. So that is definitely, like, motivation. I mean, like, he broke his ribs. Yeah. And I mean, if he, okay, if the husband was an abusive asshat, original OG asshat, 
Peter was nicer and to her and whatnot, then they could have conspired with each other to kill the husband. But May could have been a family affair. It could have been mom and two sons planning to kill dad. Exactly. But that's not any of the evidence. We don't we know. <laughs> None of the evidence. There was no evidence whatsoever. It, there was none. So then how does it lead to her being arrested and murder? Well, they found a body. Oh, they In found his body? In May of 1923, so like almost a year later. Okay, so he disappeared in, yeah, in the summer of 1922. She was arrested in fall of 1922. Okay. And a body is found in May of 1923. A corpse was found in the sewers underneath of a manhole. How the... The body was decayed beyond recognition, stripped of hair, skin, and ligaments. So basically just, like, mostly skeletal remains. Mostly. He was, however, wearing a wedding ring. Some of his clothing included a jacket. I guess no pants or underwear. That comes in later. He had shoes on and a wedding ring. Okay. On the night of Francisco's disappearance... It was around 79 degrees, so maybe not jacket weather, maybe. I mean, I live in Texas, and I carry around a jacket in 100 degree weather. Yeah, but you're always cold. Yes, so I'm like one of those weird people, so I can't say whether it was or wasn't. I sleep with two fans on in the middle of winter. But apparently it was fairly hot the day Francisco disappeared, and it was about 79 degrees that night. I mean, that's pretty warm. That's not like normal people aren't going to wear jackets. So they originally ID'd the body. It was thought to be much younger than Francisco Nitti, who was in his 60s at the time. The, the study of, like, anthropology was still kind of really, really... Very new. Very new. I've watched some documentaries about it. The Civil War, studying the bones and people from the Civil War helped, and from World War One and into World War Two, kind of helped them to be able to compile, like, basically sort of a system. But basically in the 1920s, we didn't, they didn't have that. know that much. We didn't have a system. Like, nowadays, they can literally look at the bones, they can discern height, weight, they can tell if, oh, probably tell if you were male or female then, but they can tell if you've had babies, because your your pelvis does certain things when you give birth and they can tell from like how your bones are they can tell your age based on your bones well anyway. they looked at his body and they determined that the skeleton found was a little bit younger than francisco nitty or at least that's what they believed so sheriff daiso thought that the body was beaten with a mallet because there was cracking in the skull but with the advancement of forensic science today those cracks would be considered post-mortem okay. so they didn't uh, basically like the blood pools and creates like this cracking pattern in your bones when you die that is all done post-mortem the cracking wasn't because of a mallet that we know of today and that's straight from the book guys okay yeah just like you know so that's from the book yeah the body was identified by two of sabella's sons can you guess who they were asset one and asset two james and michael saying that they recognized the gold ring he was wearing and the shoes. Now, the gold ring, it, it didn't have any engravings. It wasn't fancy in any way. It was just a gold ring, just a plain everybody gold had ring. for marriage. I was going to ask, well, did they have inscriptions mm -hmm. or like any way? No, nope. so it was just question. an everyday gold ring. So just and like. And the shoes, they were everyday working men's shoes. Nothing discernible. But they were like, yeah, that's my dad's ring. Yeah, that's my dad's shoes. So they think the body is younger, but his son are like well yeah those are his shoes that's his ring yeah they identify the body and immediately without question label it as francisco nitty again both brothers have motive we've already talked about that james declared his father dead and liquidated the farm michael had a fight about two weeks before he disappeared and it got violent over money them having this body and them going like hey is this your father like if he wasn't dead and he sold the farm it gives them like a motive to they want him dead it's, they, it's better they need him to be dead, to be dead. for and a financial like, gain uh, the police or deputy sheriff Daiso were still working on the theory that Sabella and the farmhand were responsible they just didn't know how the two working together opened 
the manhole and shoved him inside. But the deputy had a theory, and Michael and James actually supported this theory. Ugh. So they had the body officially identified, and then they went in front of a coroner's jury, and that night they had Sabella and Peter once again arrested. Also, they had Charlie arrested. What did Charlie do? I don't know, but now I'm wondering what happened to the two girls. Probably with James, but whatever. <sighs> we asked how one or asked that <laughs> I'm guessing they thought that Charlie would help to open the man cover because that is a pretty heavy thing to do. Yeah, and those aren't. Those and so aren't they thought with a third person, maybe they would be able to open it up and shove Daddy Dearest in and then close the manhole and go on their way. But, anyways, so Deputy yeah. Sheriff Daiso sits down once again to try and communicate with Sabella. And by the end of the interrogation, he comes out excitedly saying, She confessed! Again, they cannot communicate. She can't speak English. I mean, maybe she knows like a few words. Yeah, I don't know what happened in that room. <laughs> That's a different musical. <laughs> I actually, I would love to do that for an episode. Totally. Anyways, I don't know what happened in that room or what was said, except apparently Sabella's big confession, which was later revealed, was whatever Charlie says is true. That's what she knew how to say whatever Charlie says is true because again Charlie can speak her language and English yes she probably would have counted on Charlie and I want to make this perfectly clear whatever Charlie says is true is not a confession no it's a statement assuming that Charlie spoke at least a little English she was probably saying something like my son can speak for me because I can't understand you whatever Charlie says happened happened but whatever Charlie said to the police I don't know. That was never seen or used in trial because the judge later dropped the charges against him. So whatever dice uh, coerced from Charlie into a confession can't actually be used against Sabella. So it was made inadmissible. Yes. They were like, you're being ridiculous, dude. You know, it was kind of a mess of a trial. Oh, okay. So Daiso believed and told the jury during the trial, so now we're at the trial, that Charlie gave the mallet to Peter. Okay, so this is Daiso's whole whole theory of how this man died that we don't even know died based on his Sherlock Holmes ability to walk into a scene and discern everything from nothing. Basically he believed that Charlie gave Peter the farmhand the mallet and that Peter was the one who beat Francisco in the head with the mallet while he slept underneath of a wagon. Wait, what? The reason he was underneath of a wagon was because it was so hot that night that sleeping underneath of a wagon was cooler. But he was wearing a coat. <laughs> Makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, is it cooler under a wagon? I don't understand. I mean, would it be cooler in your own bed than under a wagon? No. You just open windows and let air flow. How did he? Okay, I want to know. I want to be in this man's head. Then Daiso. I want to know what this train of thought is. How did this train even make it on that track? Then Daiso believed that Peter, Charlie, and Sabella must have loaded the body into the wagon that he was sleeping under and drove away to dispose of the body in the sewers. Wait, did they dispose of the wagon and that's why they had to walk later? Okay, problem with this theory that would later come out in court was there was only one hitch for the wagon and they couldn't attach the wagon to the horse to drive away because another farmhand had the hitch that night and testified to the court to prove their innocence. The farmhand was permitted every night to use that hitch to hitch up the wagon and drive a mile home. So the wagon wasn't even on the farm that night. It would have been at his house because he would have used it to drive home. Well, there you go. That's your cold and non-smoking gun. <laughs> he couldn't have been sleeping underneath of a wagon if the wagon is a mile away at the farmhand's house. Also, Peter and Sabella had no time to dispose of a body because they were so busy walking to the magistrate and walking to the police station. When would they have had time to dispose of it? because the wagon is a mile away. They walked. Again, they walked. If they had another mode of transportation, they would have used it. Exactly. To get there faster. My brain just exploded. <laughs> 
Last but definitely not least, if it was so hot, why would the body, if it was Francisco, be wearing a jacket? That's not keeping cool under a wagon with a jacket on. Well, okay, let's err on the slight side of caution. The jacket could have been being used as a pillow. That is true. Underneath the wagon. I will give you that. They put the jacket on the body to load it in the wagon. Like, he's walked out and he goes, oh, darn, I forgot my pillow. So he grabs the jacket, you know. Sleep underneath the wagon. It still didn't happen. That's still not what happened. <laughs> I mean, I'll give you the jacket theory. That's a solid theory. You might be wondering why the farmhand that is testifying that had the hitch didn't get Sabella off. Because obviously she's going to be found guilty because she's supposed to hang. Here it is. Unfortunately, this farmhand's testimony was stopped by Sabella's own defense attorney, Eugene Morin, who was very overwhelmed by Sabella's case and having his own emotional and mental issues. Basically, he's like, no, 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 no. Stop talking. Stop talking. This is literally the thing that can get your client off. And you're like, stop. And he's like, you're done. You're off the podium. Stop talking. You're done. Okay, believe me, I can more than understand being overwhelmed and having the mental issues. You know, you've known me for like over 20 years now. We we have had, you know, you know I got the mental issues. But like, come Come on, it's dude. not an excuse. It's not. So those lawyer yes. has no excuse either. You're you're responsible for your own mental wellness. And if you're having a mental break, you shouldn't be representing anybody in court. That's just the way of it. I'm sorry. Okay. And at one point in the trial, he actually defends the prosecutor from the judge. What? He's like, you know what, judge? No, he's right. He's completely right. He Stop. Okay, so this is not the lawyer that she has later. No. Okay, so she gets a different lawyer. Yeah. Good. Because this lawyer is basically, he stopped trying to defend Sabella halfway through the trial and started obsessing over the fact that the corpse had no underpants, stating if we find the underpants, then we find the killer. And because of the shift and her defense attorney's inability to do his job, it left Sabella open to be preyed upon by prosecutors. And the judge, the judge, even warned Marone, her defense attorney, multiple times that his incompetence was harming his client. Oh my god, that just hurts my brain. I'm sorry, I don't so know much. if this is a thing, but can't a judge just like, you're not doing your job, kick them out of the court? Isn't that what a judge is for? I don't know. I'm unsure. Let me look that up real quick. Okay, a defendant or defense attorney can request a different judge, but I don't know. Can, I don't, yeah, I can't find anything about the judge actually being, removing a lawyer from the case. Well, let us know if you know the answer. Go to Instagram. Yeah, go to Instagram or Twitter and let us know. We also have a Facebook page. Yeah. You can find it all of that under Curious Tales Podcast, a dark history podcast, or just Curious Tales Podcast. Yep. During the 1920s, like I said before, there were very few laws that protected women from domestic abuse or even regular abuse. So a lot of beautiful women during this time would end up on the stand in their finest jewelry, her finest dresses, and the hair all done up, and they would smile and bat the pretty eyelashes at the jury and give their best sob story as to why they did it, or why they didn't do it, and how much they loved their husbands, and how much they, they didn't mean to hurt their lovers. But she can't even speak English, so she and, can't do that. And the jury would give these beautiful women a finger wag, and a don't do it again. And these gorgeous women would be let go and deemed by the press too pretty to hang. Oh, no. Something to know about Sabella. Sabella was not traditionally pretty. Worn down by a lifetime of farm work, she never adopted American mannerisms or a language. She grunted a lot, and she had a very poor posture. Manly posture. She she sat with her legs open. She did not wear traditional 1920s clothes. Instead, she wore poor people clothing. And she was an Italian immigrant during a time where it was not good to be an Italian immigrant. They were considered one of the most violent ethnicities at the time. 
Right, because this is the height of the 20s, which which had gangs. a lot, a lot, yes, gangs, a lot of mobs. Yeah. And things. And the Italian mafia was a thing. A big thing. And so the prosecutors Ugh. knew that they had a chance for a win here, even though the case was ridiculous. Even though they had very little evidence. Hell, they barely had a body. If the jury saw her as ugly, they could actually win their case. And after letting all these beautiful women go free, they needed a win and they would get their win. So the prosecutors built much of his case around her looks, leaning on sexism, racism, and stereotypes to convince the jury that Nitty was perfectly capable of killing her husband because she was an ugly animal. His words. That is so horrible. He said, can you see that woman? No, she isn't a woman. She's a fiend. She is not a woman, said the prosecutor. And the prosecutor and the media dragged her name appearance and reputation through the mud and the jury found her guilty of murder and she became the very first woman in Chicago history to be given the death penalty. Okay so are these people the police police to arrest you for murder or are they the fashion police? You know what in court in jury there's a reason you dress up your client and you well, make them absolutely. I mean, and you make sure that they behave themselves and act in a certain way. Oh yeah, you absolutely you see that. Very often there's been multiple cases where you might have like this gothy teenage girl who killed her parents or something. That's another case. And then she just shows up in court and she's like this preppy girl and it's not anything she would have worn. Because it made her look pretty to try to gain sympathy. Yeah. You would think that her being the very first woman in Chicago history to be given the death penalty, there would be way more information on her. Way How about more. all the other women who were guilty, but they were pretty and they could speak English? Yeah. The newspapers obsessed over her trial and they ran fair and flattering stories on July 10th, 1923. The day she was given her death sentence. Genevieve Forbes reported, and remember her, she's kind of important. Okay. Genevieve Forbes reported in the Chicago Daily Tribune that the jury gave the death penalty to, quote, husband killer, Sabella, a dumb, crouching, animal-like Italian peasant. Forbes wrote that the jury read the verdict, quote, Miss Nitty ran stubby fingers where the dirt was ingrained in broken nails into her matted hair. She shifted her stocky legs and smoothed out the dark blue skirt made full and short for work in the field. She hadn't understood a word, but she twisted up her face in a grotesque angle of fear and inferocity and cruelty and hope. Yeah, so that's what she said. Wow. That's like the only thing positive in that was she was hopeful that this would all just come to an end and she'd just go back to her two little girls. Genevieve Forbes was the one who was very harshly bashing her in the newspapers, calling her ugly, an animal. I think they even called her a monkey at one point. I mean, just horrible names and horrible words. She had not understood a word of the trial and it wasn't until the following day that someone told her the news and she was to be hung for the murder of her husband in just 95 days. She reportedly fainted. So that's like, that's basically like three months. Yeah. It should also be noted that Charlie was saved and charges dropped, but Peter was also given the death penalty. But Peter could at least speak English. Yes. But it was the same non-existent evidence. Well, okay, if you think and about it. And um, did they have the same lawyer? Because... If you think about it, though, he is a man, an Italian man. He does not have... Oh, yeah, he's definitely working for the mob. Yeah, he does not have the same liberties that a woman does. Uh, true. A woman, that away with, yeah, a woman can get away with... Yeah, a woman can get away with murder in 1920. Literally. A man cannot. Oh. Okay, I getcha, I gotcha. And because they gave her the death penalty, they would have had to give him the death penalty. Okay. They managed to save Charlie, but they could not save him as well. Uh, just so sad. 
The case obviously scandalized the city during the 1920s, and the newspaper ran stories of the five women of Murderous Row, and Spella Nitty was one of those five. But something good did come of Genevieve Forbes' harsh words and criticisms. Her articles caught the eye of a defense attorney who had picked up the paper one day and read an article about Nitty's trial. Okay, so is this the lawyer that's going to help her? Yes. Helen M. Cerise. Wait, a girl? Lawyer? Yes. She's pretty remarkable. She was a graduate of DePaul University Law School and in 1921 became the youngest woman in Illinois to receive a law license. She was 21 years old. Unable Whoa. to get a job because of her gender, she set up an independent practice specializing in women's cases. This was during a time when women were not allowed to be on a jury and it was often stated that women had no place in a courtroom. So she was sort of already a remarkable woman. She can't get a job because she's a girl. So she just starts her own? Yeah, she starts her own firm and then specializes in women's cases. And she's 21. Yeah. And then eventually when she's 23, she hears of Sabella's case. Man, at 23? Yeah, I was not, definitely not a lawyer with a, my own firm. I know, right? <laughs> she puts us all to shame. <laughs> what are we doing with our I life? don't know. Oh, wait, this podcast. Oh, yeah. Hey, hi, hi guys. guys. <laughs> she was one of five Italian-American lawyers who stepped up to help Isabella. Isabella? Sabella. Bella. She, okay, she was one of five Italian American lawyers who stepped up to help Sabella Nitti by filing for an appeal. Okay, so. I mean, this woman suddenly had an army behind her. She had five, no, six attorneys. So please tell me that the guy with the wagon gets another chance to testify and goes, seriously, he couldn't have slept under the wagon. The wagon was in my house a mile away. Even better, they tracked him down and they got an affidavit from him. Nice. And then, because Sabella and Peter basically only had days before their scheduled execution. Wait, days? Days. Like, oh maybe God. a week to two weeks. So they were like, cutting it real they close. They basically ran the affidavit to the Supreme Court of Illinois. Uh-huh. And they were like, you can't hang her. We have proof. <sighs> yeah. Just days before it was supposed to happen. And the Supreme Court agreed to read the case, but it wouldn't be read until winter of 1924. So basically she's given it, they're given a stay of execution. For like a year. She's stuck in limbo for a year. So nothing would be done for almost a year and Sabella, again, was in limbo. She was in jail. However, Helen, she saw this as an opportunity, a good opportunity. She saw this as a way to forge a plan and Sabella and Helen officially met in late July and even though Helen or any of the attorneys couldn't speak Sabella's dialect of Burris, they found ways to communicate. It was in this moment that Helen thought of a way to save her client, and she does it in the most remarkable way. With evidence? No. Helen, she was a very beautiful woman. We should post pictures on the Instagram. Later. I will post pictures of both Sabella and Helen, and maybe even one of Genevieve Forbes if I can find one. She saw that Sabella was a small, muscular woman, but that her features could be delicate. Some of her mannerisms and grunting noises were a bit strange and very unladylike, but she did not see this grotesque monster or this crouching animal as described by the papers. Instead, Cerise saw something much more. Selenity had the potential to become too pretty to kill. Oh my gosh, so this is the part in the narrative where we have a makeover. So Helen would return, <laughs> but this time she brought a hairdresser and she dyed Sabella's hair and cut her hair in a more modern ladylike fashion. Basically her hair was really long and she wore it up in a bun a lot of the time, but they cut it to be like a 1920s like bomb kind of thing. Helen then painted Sabella's face and dressed her in more fashionable ladylike clothing. Also Sabella had grown quite thin, so while in prison, Helen smuggled extra food rations to Sabella. She needed Sabella to appear healthy in beauty, mind, and figure. So yes, time for a makeover. Next, she worked with Sabella to teach her proper 
proper etiquette and mannerisms for the courtroom, while also teaching her English. She sat down and taught this woman English, and Sabella could not read or write, but Sabella learned, learned English. Sabella was also advised to refrain from rocking. She had a tendency to do this when she was nervous, and she constantly did it in trial or in the courtroom. Stuff like that that you do is really hard to, like, stop. Yes. Helen never hid anything from the prosecutors or the press, and soon newspapers, including Genevieve Forbes, was reporting on Sabella in a different light, stating that Sabella had gone through a sort of transformation and became a beautiful butterfly. Basically, she was like, yeah, we treat beautiful women differently. I'm going to dress her up and make her beautiful so you will all agree she's too pretty to hang. Wow. She's being very manipulative here. Well, she looks at the system and it goes, that works. That yeah. gets the guilty ones off. So maybe it'll get my innocent one off. The paper made mentions of the jail school and the Chicago Daily Tribune Genevieve Forbes commented on how jail can do a lot for a woman. The comment was directed towards not only Sabella, but the other women who were beginning to see Sabella's transformation and doll themselves up and make themselves pretty for the court. So inadvertently, Sabella is the reason why Beulah and Belva get off later. Yeah. They ask for access to cosmetics cabinet so that they can dress themselves up, give themselves haircuts, get themselves some clothes for court. It is how a lot of women got out scot-free. Uh, the move to make over her client was actually a brilliant plan because it avoided any appearance that the defense was trying to underhand or be manipulative. And it allowed critics to chastise the city's legal system by acquitting beautiful women while a homely but innocent woman was subjected to a trial so faulty that the Illinois Supreme Court had to intervene. <laughs> oh, yes. So basically, a lot is happening with just a simple makeup. So, like, because of the fact, they're like, they looked at her as she was and were like, well, you're ugly. So, yeah, you definitely killed your husband. Good hang her. She's ugly. But this one who did kill her husband, it's like, oh, she's pretty. No, she can't be hung. But then suddenly, whoa, you're not ugly anymore. Oh, no, I do not know. We have made a terrible choice. Yeah. And now the public who was initially against her is now supporting her and trying to fight for her innocence and you would think that this influence would sort of convince the prosecution to just let it go but they actually fought harder to prove her guilt they worked around the clock to try and find new evidence they were under immense pressure to win the case because of belva gardner and beulah anon beulah anon was a married woman who shot I'm going to get his name wrong. Consult a cow stead. I'm going to go with cow stead. Her lover, who we, we will now just call her lover, in the back. According to her initial story, they had been drinking wine, which led into a huge argument. She apparently feared for her safety, stating that he was trying to rape her. There was a gun on the bed, and they both reached for it. But Beulah got to it first and shot her lover. While he was putting on his coat and his hat. Because I guess he decided to reach for the gun and was in all like, nah, never mind, it's fine. Where's my hat? Where's my coat? <laughs> they <Whoa! laughs> both reached for it while he was putting on his hat. And his hang on, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, ah! There's a lot to take in there. She played the Foxtrot record. Hula Lau. Lau? Hula Lau? I think it's loud. Over and over for about four hours as she sat and drank cocktails and watched her lover die. Oh, good lord. I know, kind of savage. It's like so savage. It's like, you dead yet? No, nope. time for another cocktail. And then she called her husband to say that she had killed a man who had tried to make love to her. She claimed self-defense in her trial, and the press was mesmerized by her beauty, stating that she was too beautiful to hang. And the jury, who was made up of only men, agreed that someone that beautiful couldn't have a violent bone in her body, and they let her go. It also probably helped her case that she faked a pregnancy. Jury was never going to convict a pregnant woman. Wow. I 
I know, right? It's almost like spot on on the movie. It really is. Yeah, or the musical. But Belva Gardner, who is the inspiration for Velma's, is a little bit different. She allegedly shot her lover, Walter Law, a married man with one child. Law was found sprawled in front of Gardner's car with a bottle of gin and a gun lying beside him. Gardner found later at her apartment with blood-soaked clothes on the floor, confessed that she was drunk and was driving with Law but couldn't remember what happened. The press deemed her too stylish to hang and the jury also acquitted her. Like, these two women clearly did it. There was evidence galore, and they decide to go after Sabella Didi, where there is absolutely no well, evidence. Well, to be fair, to be fair, Sabella happened before these two. But she was arrested around the same time, the second time, and put on trial around the same oh, time. Okay. Her trial is going on at the same time as okay. Belva and Eula, because wow. they're learning from her. That if you're pretty, you'll go you further. Off. You'll get off. Wow. Yep. Okay, go on. There were several more women like this who were just too pretty to hang, so the prosecution needed a win. They needed Sabella to be found guilty. They needed to prove to the press that they weren't just letting women go. Luckily, the six attorneys backing Bella's corner were just as ambitious and very smart. But even though the prosecution was working very hard to find new evidence, they became distracted. Okay. In the summer of 1924, there was a case. Two boys, Leopold and Loeb, were arrested. They were two very wealthy students at the University of Chicago who decided to kidnap and murder a 14-year-old boy named Bobby Franks in Chicago, Illinois. I don't know why I put in the Illinois. We're all in Chicago. Yeah, the whole thing is in Chicago. Yeah. Basically, they did it because they committed the murder characterized as a demonstration demonstration of their intellectual superiority, which enabled them to carry out a perfect crime and absolve them of their responsibilities for their actions. It was basically a science experiment. Okay, well, they clearly didn't get away with it. So. <laughs> Actually, I have no idea if they got away with it or not, but they definitely got arrested. That may be uh, for another episode. Yes, I definitely want to do it. Wow, this episode. episode has already spurred like two more. I know, right? Three more if you want to consider doing Belva and Beulah as two different episodes. It's a possibility. We yeah. would have to do the research and see how, how far it would take us. Anyway, continue. So, basically, instead of finding their smoking gun, the same firm that was prosecuting Sabella Nitti was also working to prosecute Leopold and Loeb. And they, they're like, it was like an all man's on deck kind of situation. They pulled people from trials to try and find every evidence. It became the biggest, most famous case in Chicago history still to this day. Wow. Yeah, kind of lucky for her, kind of bad for this Bobby kid, you know. Well, I mean, he's dead, so. That's what I mean by bad for this Bobby kid. Instead of finding the smoking gun that would have ensured Sabella's guilt and give them a win, they spent all their time on this case. So I guess by the time retrial comes around, they're kind of like, oh, wait, wait, well, oh, oh, we forgot about you. When Nitty <laughs> appeared in court to set a date for her retrial, her transformation was obvious. The prosecutors looked across the room at Sabella and she wore a stylish black dress and high heels. Her hair was freshly colored curled and tucked under a light gray hat. Basically, she was beautiful. She looked like a smiling mother. She held a pen in her right hand, ready to take notes. Like, she was at a luncheon or something like that. So she basically looked... Her hand... She, she just looked like a pretty middle-aged woman. Yeah, she, she no longer grunted. Her hands were folded in her lap. She just smiled and she batted her pretty little eyelashes. She seemed optimistic about the day in court and had broken into a smile that spread cheerfully across her face. That was a terrible problem for the state. Sibella Needy looked like a sweet mother. 
too sweet to kill. Because of her new appearance and her new mannerisms, and because the prosecutor had no new evidence, again, because they spent all their time on this other case, she and Peter were released on bail. Oh, yay, so now they can go right off into the sunset and have their lives together. No. Needy becoming suddenly popular in the public's eye because of her new look, her trial date kept being pushed back until the charges were eventually dropped. Okay. So there was no actual retrial. Okay. Peter and Sabella went their separate ways after they made bail. Oh, that's so sad. Sabella actually has sort of a happy ending, though. Okay. Don't know what happened to Peter. He was not important to the narrative. That happens. Could not find anything on him. I think I found a last name at one point, but I didn't write it down and I could never find it again. So there you go. Sabella stayed in Chicago for about a decade and raised her two daughters. She eventually remarried and retired to California with him. Her youngest son, Charlie, followed her as well as one of her daughters to California. And she has sort of a happy ending. You know, she moves out after like 10 years or whatever, 12 years, and marries and she she falls in love and kind of gets another chance at a new life. And her son and daughter follow and they, they have a happy life together. So you know what this story tells me? Well, Helen Cerise and the other five attorneys would go on to fight for other Italian immigrants' rights to a fair trial. I mean, they they did. They, They did it all. And Genevieve Forbes would go on to write a play that would later become the musical Chicago. Oh, based on all of these. Yeah. Based on it all, Genevieve Forbes is the one who wrote the play. Somebody else took that play and turned it into a musical. But she is the reason we have the story to this day. And she does, in the musical, kill off Sabella, but she does it in a way that's like, we made a mistake. She was innocent. She's even portrayed in the musical as being innocent, but she can't express her innocence because she cannot speak English. Right, I think she was like, you said she was a Hungarian ballerina. She's a Hungarian ballerina in the musical. Um, I did write down, we still recognize or assume that evil has an appearance. Pretty people are innocent and everyone else hangs, even if they are innocent too. Wow. That's what I wrote after this. So okay. that was the story of Sabella Needy. You know what it gets from me? What? We judge people by their appearances. Yeah. And not who they are. I mean, it's very poignant. Okay, if you look at somebody like Ted Bundy, mm-hmm. who we will cover eventually, because you can't do a podcast that covers true crime without Ted Bundy. Of course not. But I mean, he was a very charismatic, very, charismatic, very handsome, but he didn't get off because the evidence was all there of his crime. Right. That was why he was able to do what he did for so long. Yes. It's because we have a very specific idea of what evil looks like and it is never a pretty person. No. We assume that those... Which I find funny because a lot of the time in movies they are portrayed as... Sometimes they are portrayed as beautiful women. Sims fatales. Yes. They almost always get away with it or get killed in the end. But they never really have a jail time moment where where they spend time in jail dealing with their uh, you know guilt or even if they didn't have guilt but they they don't spend time they don't pay for their crime they it's you they're either killed or they never get caught you have two things creepy old men or femme fatales yeah in our idea of what evil is yeah in that mindset but yeah i'm not saying and i want to say that she was not ugly i you showed me pictures i will post pictures onto our instagram she was a very lovely woman and i think she was very lovely before the makeover and you too. showed me a before and after picture and she was not horrible looking it's just she was not what that perfect idea of what a woman was supposed to be. But Helen Cerise 
saw that their system was flawed. And then she used that flaw to get Sabella out. She basically exploited the system and to and, free well, an innocent woman. At the same time showing them this is why I'm able to exploit the system because this system shouldn't even be. It, the system is damaged. She showed everybody that the system was damaged and she even goes on to fight to try and correct the system. She goes on to fight for women to be in court on a jury and other things like she has a Wikipedia. She she did she did a lot more and I almost kind of want to do Helen Cerise at another date because she seems like a quite interesting we should so Person. totally do that. So this is their at least three, maybe four episodes. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that was the story of Sibella Needy, the Italian immigrant who was not a Hungarian ballerina. That part I was slightly disappointed about. <laughs> Well, but I do like the fact that the play portrays her as being this beautiful woman who is obviously innocent in all of this, but she's just this sweet woman who got caught up in something. Luckily, in real life, she didn't hang, which was quite a shock to me. Because right. I looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, she surely died, right? Like, I knew that Chicago was based on several women from the 1920s. Honestly, I thought that she hung. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing I love about true crime is there are so many twists and turns. You never know what's going to You're happen. You're like, I mean, how is this stuff real? You don't actually expect somebody to be accused of murder and then get off from being accused of murder because they had a makeover. That's just not something you expect to happen in real life. No, that's like that's like a movie. That's straight out of a movie. So mine was again a little bit on like the injustice of it all. So I think I'm going to work on something that's a little less, you know, women's rights. <laughs> Well, the one I'm going to do, our next episode is going to be a straight up murder. But it's also a love story, guys. I thought you were doing serial killers. Yes, but it's a love story. Oh, a love story of serial killers. Yes, a love story of serial killers. Look for that next week. Yes. Uh, next Wednesday. We're posting on Wednesdays. We have decided Wednesdays are our days. That was really interesting. Yeah. So if you want to tell us how you felt about this episode, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter. Twitter, and we have a Facebook page. You can just look for us on Curious Tales Podcast. Yep. I and think that's what it is on all three. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And Wait, do we like and subscribe? Uh, I'm sorry. Don't Cut forget to out. subscribe. Well, don't forget to follow. Oh, follow. So then you know when we upload a new episode. <laughs> and um, Hey, maybe we should post these to YouTube. <laughs> I have seen other podcasters do that. Yeah. I mean, why not? Maybe we um, should. So don't forget to like and subscribe if this turns out to be on YouTube. All right, everyone. I'm Missy. Wait. Wait. You're what? <laughs> I'm Micah. <laughs> Wait. Hi, everyone. Okay, everyone. I'm Missy. I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> She's Micah. Oh, okay. You're Micah. Bye. We'll see you next time. We we have um tombstones we have to um go paint for your mother. And, and put and, them and out. Put them out. <laughs>